The battlefields of Battletech are home to more than just the lords of the battlefield. While battle mechs stride across this realm, destroying much of what comes across their path, what happens beneath them? Vehicles fire cannon rounds into their targets, and artillery and airstrikes rain from above. But even further beneath all of this horrifying splendor stands the most basic component of all warfare since before recorded history on Terra. The average man and woman in Battletech, those who opt to, or are required to, take up a rifle or other weapons into their very own hands to face down the war machines and other horrors of the advanced militaries all around them, they are almost as vital if not just as vital as they have always been. In this video, I will be covering the unsung heroes of Battletech, the ones most forgotten about when the histories are told across the Inner Sphere, the Standard Infantry. War as we understand it today, and understand it in Battletech, in the form and function of organized armies fighting one another, predates written history. The earliest evidence surrounding human conflict involving armies in some form, with dedicated infantry, appears to be during the Bronze Age, and likely started around 4000 BCE. Prior to this, there would have been warfare as well, but it was in a way that we would not recognize quite as easily. At these early times, men were conscripted, or raised, into a force. Armed with bronze weaponry, which was often spears, though eventually bows as well, and they were drilled to fight against enemies of their city-states or homes. With time and resources, other modes of offense and weaponry were added. Animal husbandry and craftsmanship led to the first introduction of the chariot, and then later the introduction of horseback riding warriors. The materials used for combat would go from copper, to bronze, to iron, to steel. Methods of how formations could be used, how people were trained, and the equipment they wore would all evolve with time. But the fundamental qualities of war remain the same. Artillery would begin to make an appearance as well, first in the form of bolt and rock throwing machines designed to bring down primitive walls and other city fortifications, before evolving over time into cannons and then into modern cannon and rocket platforms capable of leveling whole grid squares when launched in unison. Gunpowder would change warfare significantly, replacing swords, bows, and spears over time with muskets, rifles, and assault rifles. Horses too would find themselves replaced by machines, which would evolve from armored cars and tractors into primitive tanks before becoming armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles, and modern armor. All of which would use more and more advanced weaponry themselves, such as long-range cannons or missiles. In modern warfare, during the First World War, aircraft would begin to appear on the battlefield as well, before becoming even more important, evolving into more sophisticated planes, and then into jet-powered aircraft and helicopters. But during all of this, during all of this evolution to much of the standard scene up until modern day, the soldier is the unchanging component. These troops on the ground have evolved along with these even more hostile environments and machines. And in the world of Battletech, this remains unchanged. Because one of the key components of warfare Perhaps the most common single element of it across the inner sphere in various conflicts is still the soldiers on the ground. In fact, the majority of conflicts in the inner sphere at low and moderate intensity involve infantry and their support vehicles more than they involve the titanic steps of gargantuan battle mechs. Fighting in cities is rife with infantrymen exchanging rifle and laser fire, as well as the use of infantry fighting vehicles and other support. To peer at the average uprising in a city or planet, or the invasion of a periphery power over a dispute between individual worlds or rogue planets, would likely be the same as peering at many of the battlefields of the 20th and 21st centuries. These are the true battles of this era, more than anything else. 
And this isn't to say that infantry, or ground troops, don't participate against the most dangerous foes of the era as well. Namely, battle armor and battle mechs. Soldiers play a major role in fighting against battle mechs, especially when one side of the conflict are at an industrial, financial, technological, or overall material disadvantage. This is often pronounced when the defender uses soldiers in this way. Interestingly, the way infantry deal with such adversaries, or even regular tanks, differs little to how things would be done on ancient Earth. Infantry tend to fare poorly in the attack against armored assets in the open, be they bipedal or on treads, and instead will need to lean into their own advantages. Digging into prepared positions is a major advantage of these most dangerous of adversaries. And when this isn't available, fighting from thickly forested terrain or from buildings, particularly in dense urban environments. These areas make attacking them more difficult to hit or even detect altogether. From these positions, they can set up anti-mech weapon teams to harass, disable, or destroy armor, as well as firing on them with their main rifles when applicable. Should they do this well and lure mechs or tanks into their own charge ranges, the infantry can attempt to swarm attack the battle mechs in question, latching on to these heavy platforms and slowly tearing them to pieces. But this is a desperate, risky attack. Many battle mechs and armored vehicles have been disabled or destroyed by false confidence, or by unknowingly coming into a hostile street or clearing within a forest, only to be bombarded with anti-armor rockets and gunfire before being destroyed through swarm attacks or left crippled by the ambush. But when these attacks fail, especially if the battle mechs in question are supported or they have anti-infantry weapons on board, it can result in a horror show for the infantry who had attempted to bring down this figurative elephant. Whole platoons may be erased in a wave of heavy mech machine gun fire, or flamethrowers and plasma, to mention just a few of the atrocities they may face down in the case of a failed defense or ambush. Failure is not an option for such brave foot soldiers in such dire circumstances. Infantry can be the ultimate undoing of an armored assault into these regions when they are defended by these forces. There are remarkable instances of success either holding out or achieving stunning victories against the odds as well by these, the least thought of elements of any army. The irony being that infantry make up the bulk of these armies, even still, yet are not remembered. But there is one bane to the infantrymen which they have few solutions for beyond simply outnumbering these most vicious of opponents. And that is battle armor. With the arrival of the clan invasion came the arrival of not only their genetically engineered, monster-sized superhuman soldiers, but their advanced battle armor as well, in the form of the clan elemental. These creations would be death and destruction to the infantry of the inner sphere upon making contact with them. Each suit is protected to such an extent that even mech weaponry may not destroy it, for starters. Worse yet, all of them are armed with both melee-capable, mechanically enhanced weapons, as well as dedicated anti-infantry mech machine guns, which work just as well on their unarmored ground counterparts. The tight spaces and controlled environments that work in the infantryman's favor, unfortunately, work just as much in favor of the suits of battle armor, whether they be inner sphere battle armor or the dreaded clan elementals. Sadly, when engaging such enemies, the only true advantage infantrymen may have is simply numbers, which is a tragic approach to warfare, and it is a disservice to the lives of the brave men and women fighting for either their homes or for their states. But all the same, it is these soldiers who garrison and otherwise hold planets. It is these soldiers who are the true last line of defense of any world and the basic component of any army, even in the far distant future of the 31st and 32nd centuries. In the world of Battletech, from 4000 BCE fighting in the Middle East and elsewhere, all the way until the year 3152 AD, it is the common citizen, the common human being, taking up arms that is the most important single presence in any war or conflict. For this entire period of time, despite advances in other means, 
the truth is soldiers on the ground may be mitigated in their importance, but never eliminated. No mech, no drone, and no battle armor so far has changed that. Not truly. Over 7,000 years of war and tragedy has only one face, and it is unchanging. A human one. There are a multitude of major campaigns and engagements where infantry played a major role, and not simply in an abstract way. I felt it important to discuss several of these instances here. There are, just to be clear, too many battles to be counted where infantry are truly of some importance. These are just a few to give an idea of when infantry were completely decisive in a battlefield engagement. On June 25th, 2788, Comstar would seize Terra away from the squabbling successor lords in their own attempt to preserve the planet before the true bloodletting of the succession wars could turn the planet into even more of a ruin. It would involve the remnants of several divisions who'd sworn loyalty to Jerome Blake and Comstar, rather than following Kerensky into the exodus into the Great Unknown. This plan to seize the planet was required to be done within 72 hours, and would involve the routing of the forces of the Free World's League, Capellan Confederation, Draconis Combine, and Lyran Commonwealth. Only two forces put up major resistance. In Berlin, the armed forces of the Federated Sun weren't caught unaware, and made a fight of their eventual defeat, but defeated they were. In South America, two divisions of former SLDF infantry who had not sworn allegiance to Comstar would put the entirety of the operation into jeopardy. Major General Lauren Hayes had been in overall command of the Comstar forces that would intervene. The attempt to force the 79th and 123rd Mechanized Infantry Divisions into submission from their hold in the Amazonian rainforest was a disaster for the Silver Shields. Mechs were employed at the opening of the battle as terror weapons, and instead of achieving anything resembling victory, the dug-in infantry, veterans of the brutal war which had plagued the inner sphere from just prior to this operation, would savage these mechs that were sent against them. This problem had to be solved before the window closed, and the main way to uproot them simply wasn't more battle mechs, but instead were some of the best infantry in the entire inner sphere. The 13th Royal Infantry Division would be deployed along with the remnants of the survivors of the battle mech division that had been deployed prior, in the depths of the jungle and surrounding terrain, as well as in villages and other urban combat locations. The 79th and 123rd mechanized infantry would eventually be worn down, pushed into a pocket, and forced to surrender or die fighting. Mechs mostly got in the way during this slugfest. Truth be told, this was an infantry engagement. Infantry on both sides carried the day. Tukiyid, the grand confrontation between the clans, and ironically once again Comstar, would be another premier battle for infantry and in this instance their greatest rival, Battle Armor. The engagement would be one of the bloodiest in history, and certainly one of the bloodiest in the history of the clans themselves, who rarely saw conflicts either so intense or so brutal. While many of the most notable battles in Mech Warrior of this scale are indeed pure mech-on-mech -mech clashes, or mechs fighting tanks. In the case of Tukiyid, this was a true battle of combined arms. Infantry, tanks, aerospace assets, artillery, and of course battle mechs all took up major components of this battle. Infantry would play an incredibly important role, mostly on the side of Comstar, but the clans had their own assortment of non-armored and battle-armored infantry themselves. The role played in Tukiyid by infantry cannot be overstated as demonstrated by the structure of Comstar levels during this time. Infantry occupied positions, acted as bellwethers for incoming attacks, performed recon, called in artillery, held defensive lines, ambushed enemy mech assets, and fought in house-to-house -house and room-to-room -room fighting against both battle armor and other infantry forces. The comparative mass deployment of infantry by Comstar, in all likelihood, played an immense role in the victory of the Comguards in one of the most storied battles in all of history. But that came at a steep price, and one which cannot be quickly forgotten. Comstar's casualties on Tukiyud were steep, with huge numbers killed and wounded, extending well into double digits of a percentage for both. These soldiers fought, 
and died for the Inner Sphere and their beliefs, and did so heroically. The mechs may be all people remember, but the infantry are the ones who fought, perhaps even harder. Infantry would play key roles in warfare across the rest of the Age of the Inner Sphere, as described in the introduction of this video. From battles which raged during the clan invasion, such as Twycross or Luthien, to the succession wars and the desperate struggles between desperate powers, such as the violent confrontations on Tikhonov during the Fourth Succession War, or the battles in the Draconis Combine in the War of 3039. Infantry are a staple of warfare. They are warfare, still, in the same way as they have always been. During the Dark Age, when most militaries were running to catch up, it cannot be overstated how important infantry were. Battles within the Republic, or with the invading Novakats, Draconis Combine, and Capellan Confederation, often were decided in violent clashes between infantry and other assets, as much as they were decided by dedicated mech forces. Infantrymen would stand at this elevated place in the battlefield for an extended period of time, until the military engines of the Inner Sphere and clans had been ramped up into heightened levels, letting new tanks roll out of factories. Even then, infantry are still very much irreplaceable. Even in an age of ever-increased usage of battle armor, infantry still occupy a near irreplaceable spot, for good or for ill. The truth is, in the Inner Sphere, nothing offers a return as much as infantry does, so long as there are men and women able to be conscripted or recruited into the ranks of these forces. Whether they be militias, mercenaries, house militaries, or even clan forces, the true beat of war is not the pounding thuds of a battle mech's waltz, but the boots marching of soldiers in formation and onto the battlefield. The mechs simply get all the attention. This is a brief overview of what infantry are and how they somewhat function. I won't be describing all of the rules with their fullest details, but just giving an idea of how these are applied in-game and what they are capable of. There are several broad types of standard infantry within the game, as documented in Battletech Total War, and within the depths of Battletech The Tech Manual. And these are mostly identified by the mode of transportation that they are using when approaching the field of battle and acting on it. To differentiate these various infantry, they are typically broken down into Standard Infantry, Motorized Infantry, Jump Infantry, and Mechanized Infantry. The number of troops in each platoon and squad within varies depending on their affiliation. The most common breakdown, however, is that clan infantry come in squads of five, and five squads become a single point, or platoon, of infantry. For the Inner Sphere, this varies per state in some cases, but the most generic breakdown is of the following. Foot-based soldiers come in squads of seven, and four squads become a single platoon. This is the same for motorized infantry as well, and the same for mechanized tracked infantry. Jump infantry come in squads of seven, but only three squads apply per platoon. Mechanized hover infantry come in squads of five, and four apply to each platoon. And mechanized wheeled infantry come in squads of six, and again with four squads being one platoon. This changes in some individual cases, or for individual units, but mostly because the Inner Sphere and Periphery need to go out of their way to make the players' lives an extra bit more difficult. It'd not be the Inner Sphere otherwise without it. Infantry, one would not be surprised to discover, don't have the highest levels of individual survivability on the battlefield. Each individual soldier has a single hit point as a standard infantry. So if a platoon takes 28 damage, in the case of most Inner Sphere platoons, it is eliminated. However, this means that if a unit takes, say, 5 damage, the unit will still have 23 functioning soldiers left in the platoon, and can participate with their remaining weapon systems as well. What's interesting is infantry, due to their dispersed nature, 
don't suffer the same damage from incoming attacks from anti-mech weaponry, which is typically the weapons used mostly on battle mechs. If a large laser shoots a unit of infantry, it takes one-tenth of the damage to a minimum of one. This means that its eight damage is turned into one, as it shoots one deeply, deeply unfortunate human being, killing them. But this leaves all of their peers intact. This is one reason why mechs may struggle with infantry. If a mech like a Marauder 3R, the classic, needs to fight infantry, realistically it can only kill five in an alpha strike, barring physical attacks. This means that if it is surrounded with infantry in close proximity, it may very well be taken down well before it can do enough damage to kill the infantry attacking it. However, there are weapons that do much more damage to infantry as a whole. Mech machine guns, flamethrowers, and an assortment of other weapons do intense damage fighting against infantry. A flamer, for instance, does 4d6 damage to a squad. A small pulse laser does 2d6 damage, with only a few shots from this weapon potentially wiping out an entire platoon. So, while extremely hard to kill for certain mechs, infantry can be slaughtered by some others. As with any unit on the battlefield, their survivability is determined by numerous factors. What terrain is available to be utilized? What is the enemy fielding? What support and other units do they have? How are they placed? And how are they used by the commanders leading them? Every one of these determines just how difficult it is to displace them. But the grisly fact is, unlike mechs or tanks, who lose armor points when they take fire, infantry don't have that luxury. Every point of damage is either a badly wounded casualty, unable to continue the fight, or a human being being killed in action, never to leave the battlefield alive. Some commanders, unfortunately, spend their lives callously. As a basic breakdown of movement, there is a major variance in terms of movement between all of these different types of infantry in regards to their battlefield mobility and the impact this has on the squads in particular in the battle. Foot platoons of infantry will move one movement point per turn. Motorized infantry will move three movement points per turn. Jump infantry can jump three movement points a turn or move one ground movement point a turn. Mechanized infantry using hovercraft will move five per turn. Wheeled vehicles will move four, and tracked vehicles will move three. Terrain also has different impacts on various infantry types, with motorized and mechanized infantry often being penalized or prohibited from entering buildings or forested areas. Infantry itself cannot be in water deeper than level one as well, for instance, due to them, as you can probably guess, potentially drowning. Movement bonuses impact these troops just like any other unit you would expect it to. So if they are moving quickly, they will receive defensive bonuses as well to incoming fire. Faster moving infantry types are obviously a boon in the attack for supporting mech or tank assaults on fortified positions, and can keep up enough to play a major, or at the very least somewhat of a helpful role, in an upcoming engagement. When it comes to equipment, the standard weapons used by infantry platoons and squads, there is an assortment of different types. This fundamentally means they use melee weaponry, rifles, or special weapons. The choice of weapons depends on a series of factors. For basic infantry equipment, they typically are going to end up as being rifle squads, either ballistic rifles or laser rifles. Ballistic rifles go three hexes, while energy rifles go up to six hexes. The former tends to do more damage than the latter, depending on the volume of soldiers still alive in the squad when opening fire. Some infantry in a platoon can also get special weapons attached to each squad, with a limit of two weapons per squad. These must be the same across the entire platoon as each squad is outfitted the same within the platoon. This is where one will see heavy machine guns, LRM launchers, SRM launchers, or flamethrowers begin to appear. Sometimes this can also be melee weapons as well, such as vibroblades. This means that a 28-man unit of infantry, as is standard in the Inner Sphere, in turn may fire 20 rifles of various types and 8 rocket launchers, depending on the type of infantry and its loadout. 
This is also not to forget that some of the most frustrating infantry to fight may have rockets that are equipped with Inferno warheads. There is also specialist equipment that they can be deployed with alternatively as well, such as a tag for guiding artillery and semi-guided missiles. Some weapons also impact potential movement for different units, such as SRMs, LRMs, and heavy machine guns reducing the unit's movement by one, typically the turn they fire. Despite the seeming minimum firepower that may be brought to the table, it is more effective than one might imagine, especially for crit-seeking, or for exploiting damaged mechs which have already had their armor stripped down. Lacking respect for the damage infantry can deal is how battle mechs are brought down by them. As a final aside, infantry, unlike mechs, don't suffer many of the normal penalties to their own attack rolls, and have a 360 degree arc of fire in-game. Infantry can perform a very important all-or-nothing assault named a swarm attack. Infantry units use their anti-mech skill, which is a skill which varies between infantry and battle armor and sometimes even within those brackets. They use this skill to determine if they hit the mech they are swarming in either a leg attack or its other form. The damage is, in fact, very minimal in the case of leg attacks, for instance, hitting for only 4 damage. This, however, still is applied in a way that regardless of the status of the mech's armor, a critical roll is made. This means that a mech can be all but immobilized by these assaults and can easily become prey for their enemies. Leg attacks are very much more desirable, and almost a sure thing regarding attacking an operational mech in this way. But there is another method as well. Swarm attacks take longer to set up, but after they are applied, will in theory hit for more damage. The main problem is, is the mech may decide it doesn't want people or battle armor crawling all over it, and may be able to make such an attack stop by using rather violent methods. Together, these assaults can make closing in on infantry all the riskier for the battle mechs involved, and it is why once infantry are on the field, combined arms warfare is almost a must. This only touches on infantry in many ways. As a whole, infantry are some of the most dangerous components in the entirety of the game, and can quickly be forgotten about seemingly by enemy mechs and their commanders as these war machines stride over them. But to ignore these assets is a horrendous mistake. A single critical hit to a vital system, or simply shredding a battle mech with massed fire, can rapidly change the outcome of an engagement. Worse for many mech warriors too, is dealing with these ground forces if they've been forced to eject, to say the least. Infantry are, in all of their forms, some of the most impressive assets that one can bring to a battle, but they are one component of an overall combined arms plan more often than not. While many battles in the game of Battletech will be mech on mech, and this is a perfectly acceptable way to play, once the scope is expanded to other items, such as VTOLs, vehicles, battle armor, artillery, and other assets, very quickly this can complicate the metrics of how a battle is fought and won. But I would argue that one of the most powerful assets in any fight in Battletech, strategically or tactically, once the scope of the battle is opened up to full combined arms, are infantry. These men and women can stare down every other adversary of the setting, or they are forced to stare them down, and do so with some level of competency. When dug into a forest or a city, their abilities are only further enhanced. While their own casualties are almost assured in this environment, they are cheap enough and often plentiful enough that this will not change the outcome of their usage. Of course, fielding just infantry is more often than not foolish, but it is not foolish to field an abundance of them in a combined arms situation. Infantry, supporting and supported by vehicles or battle mechs, can have an immensely important game-changing application to any scenario. They can stall units, clear buildings, ambush battle mechs or tanks, protect objectives, hold positions, and reinforce other units as needed. 
The role of these soldiers can even vary to include the offensive, especially with mechanized, motorized, or jump-based infantry teams. They will die in these scenarios, as mentioned prior. They face horrors which few could ever wish to face. Or they may die in massed artillery bombardments. Or even the flame weapons of the giant monsters they contend with. In many ways, often battle armor is viewed as a replacement for infantry. But even this is not true. Infantry add value in ways these specialized, resource-consuming teams may not. They are vastly less expensive, and offer their own unique options both in terms of weaponry, but also in terms of their overall use. Battle armor may be able to rapidly dispose of infantry, save for when they are facing large quantities of them, but this does not make them hard replacements for them, just an asset competing for the same resource pool. War has changed dramatically over the 7,000 years of time which they have been used, in Battletech, to decide the fate of nations within the setting, and even of course in our own world. In the case of Battletech, they have been there for the arrival of man-crafted chariots, through to armored tanks, up to walking war machines known as battle mechs. They went from marching across land masses, to being trafficked across the sea, to being transported between the stars. They went from spears, to rifles, to lasers. In all of this, there has been untold suffering and loss, but also heroism and camaraderie on behalf of those brave people. While the era of Battletech places immense value on battle mechs, let it never be forgotten that while they are the lords of the battlefield, and infantry may stand beneath them, they are no less important now than they were a thousand years prior. War cannot take place without them. Occupation cannot take place without them. At the beginning of this video, I described the face of war as being that of a human being, more so than that of a mech. I not only stand by that, but I will now add to it. The face of war in the future in Battletech will be as human as it is now. For in the setting there has been nothing that can, or will, replace the organized human soldier in any army. It will be the soldiers that decide the fate of humanity in the decades and centuries to come. May their sacrifices not be in vain. Thank you for joining me here today. If you are looking for the combined arms rules for Battletech, it can be found in the book called Battletech Total Warfare. This will include general broad rules for the system, but also includes the rules for infantry and battle armor. I recommend checking it out if that's what you want to add to your games, and I will have a link in the description below to either get a physical copy or a digital copy. It's important for me to add that there are more detailed rules inside of that rulebook. They document how burst fire weapons impact infantry, as well as how certain types of infantry are restricted more seriously. This video was not a full comprehensive overlooking of all of their rules, I just looked at parts of it, in order to give everyone an idea of how these things functioned. Also, a huge shout out to Bruce Panod and Renegade HPG for allowing me to use the beautiful piece of artwork of the Marauder that you see in this video under the Broad Wars component of the video. I recommend checking out their channels. They both have YouTube channels, which will be linked in the description below. And I will also include a link to the Patreon, which funded the creation of that art as part of the fan community. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently and you'll be happy with the content, I think. Also, a huge thank you to all the YouTube members for this channel. When you hit the join button to become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel, and I can't thank you enough. Because this content is only made possible because of viewers like you. In the case of the infantry video, this is also even more so the case, as this was voted on by our members for me to cover it. And with that, I will see all of you in the comments section below.